Hey everyone, with the recent release of the new event Parallel Superimposition, there was definitely a lot of lore for myself and the rest of the lore peeps to dive through. For those of you who were there for the long stream I did about the event, you probably saw a few of these particular points addressed then and there on the spot. That said, we've got some tidbits of lore to go over, and also some discrepancies that I want to quickly go over, so let's go ahead and dive right in, shall we? Oh, right. This is spoiler territory we're approaching, so if you want to avoid this, then you might want to pause the video and read it for yourself if you'd like. Now with that out of the way, let's move on. So let's go ahead and address the big elephant in the room. For quite some time now, we've known of two non consent and non-siren characters in this story. During that time, two major sets of names have been used for these two characters. Dr. Anzel, aka the Creator, and Dr. Oust, aka the Magister. Both of these two characters have major importance to the storyline of this universe. Dr. Anzel is the creator of the Consen, while Dr. Oust was the creator or developer of the Sirens, who actually go by the name Antiochus. Yes, for those that weren't sure yet, the Sirens themselves are actually products of humankind. Looks like we were right on that one when it came to Hot About Dawn's Rhyme. That said, it's nice to finally have a face we can put to their names as this event finally reveals them to us. Gotta be honest, it took me a bit to get used to Anzel. I already had this idea of her looking like Kobayashi from the Dragon Maid anime. I mean, you guys see it, right? Right? I anyway, these two had a pretty pivotal role in this event, even if they were not around for the entirety of it. For the longest time, the commander needed to meet these two, and I'm more than certain had his fair share of questions that he wanted to have answered. Despite that, we did learn quite a bit just from the few conversations they did have together. The first one I'm going to cover is related to the Sirens. Dr. Oust gives us specific details on how the Sirens are to behave. Unlike the Consen, the Sirens were supposed to be closer to an actual puppet. Now, they at least have two main aspects that we can note so far. The vessel and the mainframe. The mainframe houses their program, which allows them to function and behave the way that they do. I guess one way to look at this would be to consider it their brains or artificial intelligence. This mainframe system allows for them to avoid errors, as they can simply reboot the particular character whenever errors are encountered. This system also allows for rogue actors to be identified and stopped immediately in their tracks. Now with all of this pretty much set in stone, I do have one major question. How does purity work? Isn't she technically a rogue actor by that definition? Now the vessel is more than just a physical body as it has all of their weapons and parts needed to do their specific tasks. What's interesting is that unlike the Consen, the vessel can be destroyed and easily replaced. Now we've already seen this with some of our more well-known sirens getting their bodies replaced. I specifically believe this is Purifier and Compiler as of now. That aside, things are pretty different to if the mainframe is lost. Should that be lost, the program will attempt to find a replacement one and simply reboot after reconnecting themselves. However, in the event that it cannot locate a replacement mainframe, it could be seen as disconnected. Dr. Oust states that losing connection to the network is considered an error. We can further extrapolate from some of his other statements. If a program is not connected, its access to key equipment is restricted. Moreover, rogue actors can be swiftly identified and neutralized. This might explain Compiler's final moments after her data tower was taken out. If we consider that to be her mainframe, then she should begin to look for alternatives to work with. As we can see in her final moments, She's attempting to find a backup to use, but unfortunately is unable to do so. As time continues, we see her slowly start to lose access and slowly begin to shut down right before our, uh, well, Helena Meta's eyes. The one thing that does remain a mystery to me is that if she's mostly a puppet, then how does she get a little sentimental towards the moment? Might there be more to them than simply the program that their mainframe houses? Could it be the cubes that were used to create them, as Dr. Aus states? Now, the other major part of their conversation that we would like to point out here is to do with their Type 2 rigging. In this conversation, the commander asks if a cube's damage can be reversed, 
Or he asks another question, which is related to if a ship girl is born with a defect in her hold data, is it possible to cure it? Both Dr. Anzel and Dr. Oust concur that it should be possible to a degree. Utilizing a spare cube could be done to help reinforce the original cube and bypass the damage of this cube to an extent. However, it's not a panacea, as it won't stop the root cause of that damage or the defect. It just simply addresses the symptoms. On top of that, if the damage is too severe to the cube, then it might be impossible to even consider that juncture in the first place. While this conversation was relatively short, it does add a very huge aspect to our understanding about Consent. Now, while I may have stated before that just because a character is defeated in battle does not mean that they are gone for good, this particular conversation adds a caveat to that. If the battle leaves them too damaged or their defect in their cube is just too severe, there may be no saving them. This could very well mean characters like Amagi might truly be gone for good. Outside of that, other critically injured characters are now concerns of mine. I mean, one major Royal Navy event ago, Hood was at death's doorstep. Is she going to make a full recovery or is she just able to treat her basic symptoms? On another note, John Barr was hurt badly at the end of The Iris of Light and Dark. What's her status? If anything, this leaves me a bit worried about some of our characters currently. The last thing I wanted to point out about Type 2 rigging is at the very end of the event. The commander found only data of the few Type 2 girls that they were around the most, while Laffy 2, for example, had no data on her currently. What this means is, well, one of two options. The first is that they may not be able to fully replicate the Type 2 rigging for others, or that it will just take some considerable time for them to create Type 2 rigging for the other ship girls like Laffy or Lexington, since they didn't have any data to begin with. Now, if they are able to recreate it and upgrade all of the concept of the Eagle Union, I think that is something the Ironblood and many other factions might find rather interesting. I guess that's just another thing we'll have to wait and see for now. Now, the last two major takeaways from this event are related to our antagonists. The first and foremost being that we have been shown a new Arbiter called the Devil 15. While we do have an idea of what Arbiters exist due to them being based on tarot cards, this Arbiter was different. Usually we learn about the Arbiters through conflict with them and we'll learn what abilities they have as we go through that. The Devil 15 was a very different situation as she pretty much fully explained how she works and what she is capable of. It's actually kind of nice knowing what the Devil 15 is capable of instead of having to slowly figure it out over time. And considering what she is capable of doing, that, mean, that would have been a very hard learning curve. Last but not least is everyone's favorite little psycho bomb on Richard herself. Towards the end of the event, she tells a riddle. I'll remind everyone of it now. Behold his majesty's castle and home. From his window, one sees his all-piercing eyes. Below him are his six faithful generals. Above him, countless soldiers stick to the castle walls. The answer is a hermit crab. I did want to say that this riddle is believed to have been solved and is a reference to the failed attack the Ashes did against the Arbiters and Zero, specifically on how the Arbiters defended Zero's mainframe. Let's kind of break this down with Bomb on Richard, shall we? His six faithful generals are his two claws and four outside legs. He uses those to move around and catch prey. When you consider the initial recount of this attack by renowned Meta, there are four Arbiters already there on the defense. The Hermit, Temperance, Strength, and Empress. Where are the other two you might be asking? Well, Empress mentions this saying, The Devil and Hierophant have already taken control of your warp devices. This places six Arbiters already in the area. Not only that, but the Devil and the Hierophant have taken control of the Ashes' warping ability, effectively trapping them. However, that's not all of it. Don't be fooled. Like other crabs, hermit crabs have four more legs. They're just on the inside. On Ian, Empress simply states that the others are already on their way to them. But Cian seems to specify this by saying that the Hanged Man, Death, Lovers, and Moon were already on their way as well, and would be there within five minutes. This creates one oddity in this comparison. Tower. However, I think it's because Tower is different. It appears like the Ashes were going to be annihilated by the Arbiters as it seems to be that that's their clear goal. 
but renowned meta states that they were sent to different branches. Right before that recount ended in that particular event, Tower is seen saying, Execute Transport Protocol. It seems like the Tower isn't letting the Arbiters do what they want. Now, Memphis Meta is aware of this in our current event and makes note of it. I did want to note of this here, as this discrepancy between CN and EN paints a slightly different picture here. Towards the very end of the event, when the Tower was beginning to purge everything in the Dream space, in EN, Memphis Meta says the following. The extraction point is just ahead, Commander. Just keep following this path, and you'll be out. I'm going back to help Helena. Need to cover your retreat, after all. Don't worry about me. We have our own way of getting out. Hurry and go. You'll be in danger if you stay here long. In CN, this is slightly changed and adds something interesting. Now, this is machine translated and slightly reworded, so it makes a bit more sense. As a result, it may not be word for word or may not be perfectly translated. I apologize for that in advance. The extraction point is here, Commander. You just need to go in and keep following this path. I'm going back to help Helena. Don't worry about us. The tower will not attack Helena and I, so we will be able to control the situation. You'll be in more danger if you stay any longer, so hurry. The tower won't attack Helena Meta or Memphis Meta? That's an interesting note. I'd say that would make me think it's an ally, but in reality, eh, something probably was designed for it to be more neutral in its overall programming. We'll have to see in the end, but that's definitely something worth noting that's different between the tower and the rest of the Arbiters. Now, there are a few more discrepancies that I wanted to make note of that I'm actually aware of currently. The first being a conversation with Jinsu Meta and an unknown party. In Ian, she says the following. I see. A one in a million escape. Things are just fine on my end, don't fuss over me. I have to sympathize with poor Vestal. Now on the CN side, it's a bit different. Is that so? Luckily there's no danger. There's no issues on my side. You don't have to worry. I'm fine. Tell Vestal not to worry. Now, the current Eagle Union's Vestal should have absolutely no idea about this Jinsu meta. So this makes me believe that we have a Vestal meta involved in this situation, as that would make a lot more sense. Now, the last discrepancy worth noting is the first gaffe that Memphis meta makes while the commander was in the dream space. To summarize it, instead of saying the reality lens, Memphis meta calls the commander by commander instead of professor, of which the commander catches this and wonders about it. I'm not sure why this was such a necessary change, but it still does do a good job and throws suspicion towards Memphis at this point. Thankfully in the end, I think it really didn't matter too much. And those are the main points to make about this particular event. This was definitely an enjoyable event in a lot of different ways. I thoroughly enjoyed it during the livestream I did of it, and I'm definitely looking forward to the next one when it comes out. I do wonder where we'll end up being but I'm pretty sure it's going to be French related currently. For that, well, we'll just have to wait and see. Until then, I hope you all enjoyed this and feel free to ask any questions that you may have in the comments below. I'll get to them as soon as I can. Now, whether you're a regular viewer or a patron supporting the channel on Patreon, thanks for watching and I'll see you all again real soon.